Jackson, they for protecting cold today. But, um, I don't know why. But, um, I eat toast on Vegemite. Toast on Vegemite. I also eat Vegemite on toast. And I wear a tie. And I don't feel cold. So, <laughs> got to be messaging that. In fact, I was looking at Isaac. There's Isaac. <laughs> He knows about eating Vegemite. <laughs> One more serious topic today. In the first four months of this year, 25 women in Australia had died as a result of gender-based violence. One woman per week dies at the hands of someone they know or someone they are in a relationship with. Gender-based violence is violence against women in general because they domestic violence uh, relates to acts occurring within a relationship such as marriage or cohabitation. And that word cohabitation I'm going to mention a few times in this context uh, a couple that is cohabiting means that they are living together but they haven't been married. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics as of November last year, an estimated 4.2 million adults in this country, that's 21%, have experienced partner abuse or violence since the age of 15. And that doesn't just affect women. 17% of women, 5.5% of men, have experienced partner violence. 23% of women and 14% of men have experienced partner emotional abuse. And this is where one partner systematically uses power to try to control the thoughts, beliefs, actions, body and or spirit of a partner. We might say that it's psychological control. 16% of women and 7.8% of men have experienced partner economic uh, abuse. And this involves, and I'm quoting here, the control of a partner's or ex-partner's money and finances, as well as things uh, that money can buy. There were 88,000 377 offenders proceeded against by police for at least one family and or domestic violence related offence in 2022-23 and that was up 6,504 offenders or an increase of 8% from 2021-22. Almost four in five family and domestic violence offenders were male. So that's 79% or 69,782 offenders. As I say, that still leaves 21% who are female and that is just under 20,000. That's obviously an issue. And uh, that's been made evident in the last few months. We've seen marches relating to this uh, in various Australian cities. A US book that I have on this subject, which was published in 1987, <coughs> said that the problem of family violence extended into church goers as well. It's a problem there. So we can't just close our minds to it, thinking it doesn't happen. So, in view of all of that, I thought some time ago that it would be good to preach a series of lessons uh, dealing with this matter. And with almost 80% of the offences caused by men, uh, that is where I'll be uh, placing my focus. But let me mention something here. As I've heard these uh, statistics over the years, I've thought, well, I wonder 
how the statistics break down on this. What is the difference between marriage couples and couples who are just cohabiting? Does that make a difference in regard to domestic violence? Let me give you some statements here. Males beating female partners are, and I quote, at least twice as common among cohabitors as it is among married partners. And that comes from the publication Cohabiting and Marital Aggression, The Role of Social Isolation in the Journal of Marriage and the Family, uh, Volume 53, 1991. Uh, an online article I read last Monday in the US cohabiting couples have higher rates of intimate partner violence compared with dating and married couples. Another online article I read last Monday again in the US one consistent finding is a higher rate of domestic violence among cohabiting couples as compared with married couples. And statistics across the board show in a whole range of ways a couple is far better off being married than just living together. Uh, you know, since, I don't know when, since the 1960s, 1970s, people have thought, well, what difference does a piece of paper make? You can just live together and be just as happy. I'm sorry, but the statistics just don't back that up. And I'm not talking about church statistics. I'm talking about statistics gathered by secular agencies and universities and so forth. You are safer being married than you are just being in a living uh, together relationship. And that's something perhaps to uh, teach your children. Now, for today's lesson, I want to talk about the idea of respect and care. We're going to start over in Ephesians 5 and verse 33. When we talk about respect in marriage, uh, as Christians, we perhaps tend to think more in terms of, okay, the wife should respect her husband. And indeed, it says in, uh, in Ephesians 5 verse 33, Nevertheless, as for you individually, each husband is to love his own wife the same as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. However, there is this desire too from women that men should respect women. Husbands should respect wives. Uh, you might think of the song Respect. It was originally released as a single by Otis Redding in 1965. And then it was rearranged and re uh, released by Aretha, Aretha Franklin in 1967. And that's the uh, song where the word respect is spelled out, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And it became a rallying uh, call for feminists and for civil rights uh, workers. So there needs to be a respect for women. And the concern these days with all the violence is that that respect is lacking. Um, I particularly want to talk, as I've said already, about the idea of men respecting women, of husbands respecting their wives. There is a view amongst some that <coughs> the Bible, with its patriarchal ideas, encourages men to regard women as inferior beings. In other words, there is a view amongst some that the Bible puts women down. According to the Bible, men were created first. According to the Bible, uh, it was a woman who sinned first. According to the Bible, the woman was to be a helper to the man. According to the Bible, the husband is to exercise leadership in the home. According to the Bible, the man is to exercise leadership in the church. Now, Really, when we say according to the Bible, we're saying, well, according to God, that's the way God has made things, but there are those who don't believe the Bible, and so they view it as a book created by men for men, uh, which puts this uh, patriarchal emphasis into it. 
Now, I, I want to talk about those, but before I do so, let me make some general points. And we'll go back to the passage that was read to us by Ephraim back in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through to 28. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. And so it continues on there. But the point from that that I want us to notice is that it was God who created man and it was God who created woman and God blessed man and God blessed women as well. So from that point of view, there is no distinction. God did not create women as inferior beings. You come over to Genesis chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. This is where God takes Adam's rib. Uh, verse 22, And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Then the man said, At last this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. There, the idea is that there was a special, unique bond between man and woman. The two genders, and there are only two genders, are of the same nature. The two belong together uniquely. And again, that is of God's doing. We go over to Galatians now in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26 through to 29. Galatians 3 beginning in verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. You are all one in Christ Jesus, and that includes male and female. There is no distinction in your relationship with God through Christ based upon gender. We both have an equal relationship with God through Christ. We are both, uh, if we are Christians, heirs uh, of God, heirs according to the promise. Um, it says here, you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. In other words, the promises that were made through Abraham all that time ago apply just as much to a Christian woman as to a Christian man. There is no distinction spiritually. Both male and female equally can receive uh, the gift of salvation and be children of God. Also, you've got that too. What well, I think of it over in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. I want to come back to this passage, but let me just read one part of that. 3 and verse 7, You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honour as a fellow heir of the grace of life. She is a fellow heir. She's not less an heir of God's grace, but a fellow heir of God's grace. So there's all of these indicators of saying, well, God has not made a distinction as far as a relationship with him goes. God created woman just as God created man. God created a special, unique uh, bond 
between the two. They are both the same nature. And in regard to salvation, there is no distinction between male and female. If you want to see something about respect for women, then look at the way Christ treats women. Read through the Gospels. It's interesting to note that on the day that Christ was raised from the dead, whom did he go to first? Whom did the angels go to first and announce the news? It was to women. It was women who took the news to men, even to the apostles. And so don't try to make the Bible say that women are inferior. And Christian men shouldn't be tempted to think that way because that would be utterly false. Now let's go back to some of the points that were raised by people who say, well, the Bible puts women down. Come over with me first. Uh, um, sorry. Um, uh, where was it? First Peter 3 and verse 7. There was a point that I wanted to make from that. So I'll go back to First Peter 3 and verse 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. Literally, live with your wives according to knowledge. Knowledge of what? Well, knowledge of her nature as a woman. Knowledge of what God requires of you in the marriage relationship. Live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman. And there would be those who take offence at that. What, we have to be treated weaker? Well, there's two right ways of taking that. Number one, generally speaking, physically, as far as muscle power goes, women are weaker than men. That's why we have men's sport and we have women's sport. And indeed, over the last couple of years, there's been a controversy in women's sport about transgender uh, athletes who have a physiological advantage. So generally speaking, yes, women are weaker. And I am stressing the word gentle, uh, general there. Uh, the other thought, thought too is that this is saying Treat your wife as you would treat someone or something weaker. For instance, you know, there are certain places you go to, antique places. Um, there's a shop that advertises, what is it, Peters of Kensington, I think it is, where they've got all sorts of expensive, fancy porcelain and stuff. Now, when I go into a place like that, if I'm wearing a, anything loose, like a jacket, which is not very often, I make sure that that jacket is, is zipped up and tight to my body because I'm scared of knocking anything over that I'm going to have to pay two or three thousand dollars for. I'm careful. I'm careful around, you know, Lavinia sometimes she'll pick up a, a, a piece of porcelain or something from a, an op shop and I'm careful about the way that I handle that. There's a clock we have in our house. Um, basically, I do not take it off the wall. Um, uh, it requires batteries. When the batteries run out, it stays there. Uh, why? Because it's a heavy clock and it's hanging on a hook and it stays there fine. I'm scared if I try handling it and rehooking it that I'll drop it. And that may well be the idea here, that you treat your wife uh, carefully. And, uh, you know, I'm conscious of all the feminist responses and all of that sort of thing, but I hope you understand what I mean here. That you take care in regard to your wife and you treat her at, with honour. And honour is the idea of value as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Now, let me get back to some of these other uh, points that were raised about the Bible. It's something 
uh, indicates the Bible's putting women down. Come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. Now, it is true that, yes, in Genesis, God creates man first, and he created a uh, woman as man's helper. But that does not make woman inferior. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 11, However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originated from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. In other words, we are codependent. We need each other. We don't exist without each other. And so uh, there is this idea, not the idea that she is second rate, she is inferior, but rather that the two go together and each relies upon the other. And what's more, that's the way that God made it. And yes, as we read, in Genesis, God created woman to be the man's helper. But um, the same Hebrew word that is used for helper uh, in Genesis 2 and verse 18 in describing the woman also describes God as our helper in such passages as Deuteronomy 33 verse 26 and Psalm 33 and verse 20. Now, the fact that God helps us does not make him inferior, does not make him our slave. And so it is with woman. The same Hebrew word is used. She is our helper, but she is not inferior. She is not a servant or a slave. And, okay, then what about the fact that uh, Eve was the first to sin? Well, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 21 and 22. For since by a man uh, death came, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. He's talking there about Adam and then of Christ. Verse 22. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And uh, a verse that goes along with that is over in Romans chapter 5. And... Um, Verse, uh, my eyes are not seeing very well. Uh, Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all mankind because all sin. But what I want you to notice in those verses is that, yes, it tells us that Eve sinned first, and yet the man is held <coughs> just as accountable there in Romans and in 1 Corinthians. In fact, the point has been raised with Eve. She felt the full effort of Satan to tempt her. With Adam, it just says he took the fruit and ate it. So uh, it can hardly be said that Adam showed himself a more noble character. Let's go over to Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 22. Yes, the husband is to exercise leadership in the home. But Christ demonstrates how that leadership is to be exercised. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as wife is the head of the... I'm just going to wrong it. I think that my reading is terrible. Um, I'll start again in verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the saviour of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands, in every, and I've spoken on occasions where women have given a very hostile reaction to that, a very audible reaction, and I can remember being challenged about this as far back as 1975, where somebody came up and said, you know, what about this? But 
most people have no idea the verse 25 is there. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So yes, it talks about the husband exercising leadership, but it talks about the husband having the unselfish attitude that Jesus Christ had and being self-sacrificial, not being a tyrant at all. And uh, the uh, point two that we've seen is that, yes, there are distinction in the roles of men and women, and I could say a lot about that because there's far more said about the roles of women, and I don't mean subservient roles, but active roles of women in the Bible. Than there are, there's a couple of things about, okay, men do this rather than women. But there's a whole lot of things there that women can do. But again, in regard to this, the point to remember is that there is no distinction between men and women in their relationship with God both stand on the same footing. So in all of this, the point is that the Bible does not encourage men to mistreat women. Uh, God does not approve of men abusing their wives. The Bible does not encourage men to regard women as inferior. That's just not there. And if any of us, uh, any man wants to read something into the Bible about men being superior and so forth, you're reading something that isn't there. But not only does the Bible uh, say that men should not mistreat women, uh, it says that men should care, particularly for their wives. Now, a few minutes ago, I made reference to Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 22 onwards. Let me just read verse 25 again. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. What you're reading there is, as I've said, a sacrificial, <clears throat> unselfish love. That is the love that a husband is to have for his wife. Now, we've talked about it many times in the past. In the Greek, and it was, the New Testament was originally written in Greek and then later translated into various languages, including English. In the Greek, there are several words for the various aspects of love. And here in Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 25, the Greek word that we're dealing with for love is agapeo. And it has several different forms according to grammar. Uh, one of those forms is agapan. And in speaking of this word, agapeo, agapan, um, the theological dictionary of the New Testament says it, and I quote, must often be translated to show love. It is uh, giving active love on the other's behalf. So when we talk about this agapeo love, we're not talking about mere emotion. We're not talking about feeling. We're talking about something that is actively expressed. Um, agapeo love is not about self. <clears throat> it is about the one who is loved. It's not about finding your own fulfillment. I've been battling for the last few days to try to remember the phrase. But you get people who say, well, I need to find myself. I feel like uh, I, I can't find myself, so I need to get away and find myself. And so it becomes all about self. That's not what agapeo love is about. Agapeo love is unselfish. It thinks about the other. And if you want an example... Um, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 and onwards. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility consider one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So get the point. You'd have an unselfish care towards others, putting the emphasis upon them, not upon self. 
And then Paul gives an example to follow. Verse 5, have this attitude of yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bondservant and being formed in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, uh, even death on a cross. See, there was total unselfishness there. Christ sacrificed himself. He gave up what he had in heaven in order to bring salvation to sinful humanity and so that is with the love that a husband is to show his wife is to be unselfish where the idea is what can i as the husband do to help my wife uh, west <clears throat> talking about agapeo love says this this is self-sacrificial love a love that impels the one loving to give himself in self-sacrifice to the well-being of the one who is loved. In other words, the one loving is the husband and he is to give himself in self-sacrifice for the well-being of the one who is loved, which is his wife. If you want a further description of the nature of love, then go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This too is dealing with agapeo, love, 1 Corinthians 13, the whole chapter is dealing with love. I'm going to read from verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. It does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It keeps every confidence. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But notice some of those qualities. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. That again is the sort of love that a man is to have for his wife. My point for today's lesson is that neither God nor God's word, the Bible, provide any basis for the disrespect or mistreatment of women by men. Indeed, neither God nor God's word, the Bible, provide any basis for the disrespect or mistreatment of wives by husbands. The example and the standard is set for us by Jesus Christ. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, that God created Eve from one of Adam's ribs. From that it has been said that woman was not created from man's head to domineer him, nor was she created from his foot to be trampled by him. Instead, she was created from his side to stand alongside him as his equal. That is the biblical picture that we need to be governed by as men in general and particularly as husbands. More on this next week. Let's stand and sing.